look like a hot mess. Whatever. Good morning and welcome back to the kitchen table. Uh, my name is Roxanne Harris and joining me is the ever beautiful Robin Parr, all the way from uh, the way west side of Canada, um, out in BC. Robin, welcome and welcome back. Thank you. It's nice to be back. <laughs> so we took a little bit of a hiatus as things got a bit crazy as uh, the culmination, the completion of the book was out and about. And I want to jump off and just talk about some really amazing things that have happened in the last couple of weeks and also uh, things that I've been hearing from women actually around the globe and their thoughts about um, their own self-esteem and how they measure up or how they don't uh, in their own eyes. And um, for that, I, I want to just uh, jump in before I go too crazy on you, Robin. How are you doing? What's up in the West Coast of Canada? Oh, just uh, keeping on with the house construction. We're finally getting some of our backyard done. But uh, yeah, so if you hear a little noise, that's what it is. And uh, it's exciting to actually undertake another project. I always enjoy that very much. It's uh, maybe one of my things that I should have done in my younger years so that I could maybe start it as a business because I really, really enjoy it. And uh, I find it fascinating. So I'm pretty pumped about that. Awesome. Uh, I love construction and more and more I actually see uh, women uh, taking on these major kind of um, contractor roles and organizing all of the construction and everything around uh, the build and the decorating and I think it's really uh, so much fun. So I'm excited for you and what you guys are going to create. Um, I I want to talk a little bit today actually about um, Audaciously Alive. And the reason being is because um, I had a couple events on the weekend. I actually took a quick flight, not so quick with the current challenges in the Canadian airline industry, but a, a quick flight out west to do it. I love doing teaching blood microscopy. And in between there, we did a couple of Audaciously Alive events and presented on my book. And the things that I was hearing from uh, women uh, kind of really broke my heart, Robin. And, you know, when we talk about pain, we can talk about physical stuff, aches, pains, indigestion, headaches, that kind of thing. But we can also um, talk about mental, emotional pain. And I think it's really important to understand or recognize that that we feel pain on multiple different levels. And so it's not just women that are experiencing physical pain. However, from my own personal experience and what I saw throughout um, just talking with about 125 women over the course of uh, the weekend is how physical pain, especially if it's chronic or left unchecked or goes on and on, really creates um, a battle in the mind. So a battle in the mind mentally, emotionally, um, so spiritually, it leads to feelings of uh, not enough, you know, woe is me, uh, depression, anger, rage. And then we tend to take it out on our family and our loved ones around us, which makes us feel worse. And the cycle moves um, all over again. And so Robin, I'm wondering, you know, shed some light on that, share your experience on just either yourself or women that you know about how unresolved issues can really sabotage our life and our day, right? Steal our day, our month, even our whole year if we're not able to move forward. Yeah, I think um, probably a few years ago during one of the episodes of The Kitchen Table, I had shared a story about my mother-in-law, how, you know, diagnosed with cancer and then having a little setback, but um, 
how you watched her go from an elated state of, um, you know, being healed and cancer free. And then the uncertainty that, you know, um, followed that and watching her mental health just rapidly just decline. And, um, you know, they say that you hurt the ones you love the most because it's the mm -hmm. safest. So, you know, kind of the backlash that we got was just all her frustration and anger and being scared and stuff. And at the time we didn't understand it. And I felt really bad about that later on in life, about not having that understanding of where she was coming from. She was coming from, you know, such emotional despair. Um, and that was her way of getting it out of her body. And uh, I've seen it in a lot of um, people around me, um, you know, whether it's a daughter or a friend or a sister or whatever, just different um, stages in life, um, mostly with uncertainty or um, physical pain. Like I mentioned with Anne, you know, with um, pains and aches and stuff in the body and not knowing what to do with it. And, and uh, the unfortunate part is most people don't understand where it's coming from. They just assume that this person has turned um, rude or um, they don't care. And they're, you know, they use the big B word like, wow, that girl is just so angry and I don't want to be, you know, around her. But I think people really miss the mark and, and uh, maybe digging a little bit more and seeing where that pain is coming from and why mm -hmm. um, they're, they're lashing out that way. So, yeah. And what I've discovered uh, along my own journey is that we really uh, don't listen to understand that um, we listen with half an ear often, even if it's our best friend, our sister, our mother, but we don't really engage or enter in um, fully into what the other person may experience. And then worse than that, we judge it against our own experience. And one of the things um, that we really have to look at is um, everybody's perception of pain is different. It's not you have a low pain threshold, you have a high pain threshold. That's completely irrelevant. And what I've explained to people is, although, you know, you might say hurt your elbow and you feel, you think that the pain is here in your elbow, we actually don't experience any pain in our physical body. All pain is felt and experienced in the brain. We have nerves that send signals and the brain goes, oh, it hurts there. And so sometimes being the master of our own mindset is really crucial because I know that when we wake up in the morning and we're like, oh, crap, you know, I'm alive again, right? It's, you know, it's going to be this horrible day full of pain or agony, depression, despair, anger. It really sets you up for an unpleasant day right? You're already anticipating that the day is not going to go well, that it's going to be full of pain or challenges, um, relationship issues, whatever it is. So one of the things I practice and I write about in the book is, you know, every day I woke up and, you know, I'm a woman of faith and I would just say, thank you, Jesus, for healing me. Even when the pain was worse, the situation was worse, I was exhausted beyond compare, thank you, Jesus. And it really sets you up differently. If we can wake up and say, you know, hallelujah, I'm alive and it's going to be a great day. Or, you know, as um, someone mentioned to me uh, a while back, when you wake up to just say, this is the best day ever. Yeah. And go and live it like it is. Mean it. Not do that lip service and then be like, pop out of bed and go, well, this day is, you know, just horrible. But really look for the pleasure in your day. And this was something I, you know, initially with the diagnosis wasn't good at. It was kind of like, oh my God, you know, how do I survive? I'm in so much pain and you become so inwardly focused, you know, that, to, you know, respond to what happened with your mother-in-law right? The person in the pain or the diagnosis or whatever is going on, right? Then becomes so internal that everything seems, you know, uh, 
disconnected or a brush, you're just brushing people off because all you can focus on is the pain. But I would challenge every woman, regardless of your situation, whether it is, you know, an actual diagnosis of some sort or whether it's just a, a tough day or a difficult circumstance, right, to look for the what else is possible in this situation. Where can I find the silver lining? How can I show up? Um, in love in this situation? How can I show up as a better sense, you know, of a better representation of me? How would God, you know, see the situation? And it causes us to react and respond very differently. We're, we're looking for a solution versus reacting out of fear, anger, grief, um, and any other myriad of emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard um, a really neat story just the other day, and it's funny you're talking about it. It's um, it's uh, a couple that, you know, at the end of the day, they would come together and they would share all their garbage that happened at the, you know, during the day, and they found themselves in a really low spot just because they were constantly dumping on each other. They were feeding negativity continuously this was wrong, that was wrong, and they never talked about anything positive. And they made a decision to, um, to take a picture in that day of something positive that happened. Mm -hmm. And whether it was a sunset or a conversation or anything that was positive, and they took a picture of it, and then they had to share it with each other and explain what was the best part of their day. And uh, anyway, so as the 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 process went on they got so excited about sharing these positive moments it start stopped at one and started going into two and three and four and they and they were looking for things continuously and saying is this the best part of my day is this the best part of my day i, I don't know like they were taking pictures of so many positive things and it totally changed their mindset and doing that, you know, are you having a bad day or are you having a bad moment thing kind of you know, came forward. And it's like, yeah, we were just having little bad moments, but it wasn't making our day. There's so much positivity that's going on all around us. And we're just not looking for those things. We're not seeking the positive out. So I find that um, a really good challenge. I think that I would love to start that in my own relationship, not only maybe with my husband, but with my kids at the end of the day when they come from school, you know, um, sitting at a supper table and trying to engage in conversations that are beneficial, uplifting, positive, you know, um, encouraging. And uh, then I, fi I find that I think that um, it creates better conversation, more meaningful conversation, and it puts you in a different stage of your yeah. life instead of negative. You're like always looking for positive things. And that's so true. You know, I've said this for years. I talk about it in the book. Every moment of every day has the potential to be awesome and amazing if we let it. Right. And so, sure, we can have all kinds of stuff happen to us. Right. And it can make us or break us. But to have that ability to reassess, reimagine, recreate, put a different meaning on the situation. And I love how those two people, right, went from, oh my gosh, I have to find something good about my day to literally having like intense conversation about really what was the best part of my day because now they're looking for it. And I really, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head with that one, Robin, is that many women have difficulty finding the good in their day, right? Seeking out the pleasure in their day. And my uh, good friend Yetta and her husband Ken um, had a challenge a couple years ago to take a photo together every day, just to kind of like bring that connection, do something crazy together. And initially it was a chore and they didn't maybe really want to, you know, do it. Well, almost three years later, they're still taking daily photos of themselves. Um, and having fun with it and trying to, you know, loosen up and relax. And they were sharing, sometimes it's just a picture of our feet, you know, together or, you know, uh, cups or something like that. But that whole point of coming together in the moment to enjoy yourself. And I think it's really imperative 
that we see situations and circumstances for what they are instead of, you know, potentially um, maybe a negative effect that we might experience out of it. I recently was on a, a flight and anyone who lives in Canada, maybe even the US, knows that Toronto Pearson Airport, shout out to y'all, is a nightmare. And um, during the last couple of years, it's become more and more of a nightmare. They're having great issues with luggage. And when I arrived there, our flight was delayed. So they said I'd missed my connection. They gave me another ticket for the next flight. The flight boarded on time. However, we sat at the gate on the airplane for over three hours and 20 minutes where, you know, the pilot kept coming on saying, oh, just another 10 or 15 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and then after this three hours had passed, he came on again and made an announcement that said, um, it seems to be that the crew, the ground crew hasn't loaded some of the luggage yet. And I'm like, I looked at the guy beside me. We both took off our headphones and we started laughing. And, you know, that was a great response. And then we kind of shared like, this is so ridiculous. Of course it would be, you know, because they haven't loaded our baggage three hours after we've been sitting on the plane. And you have to look at that perspective because even though I was supposed to be, you know, at my destination, you know, by like 830 at night. I kind of rolled into my hotel at like 3.30 in the morning, which is a huge difference when you're going to be teaching and speaking the next day. And it was just comical. Like the whole thing was just so funny, right? So I could have taken that and been really disgruntled and kind of ruined my night and put me in a bad mood. But I chose to laugh about it because the situation was completely out of my control. There was nothing I could do about it. So getting upset would have only harmed me and my state of mind and uh, my ability to kind of uh, function under the stress. So I love how um, how you shared that. And is it a, a bad day or is it just a bad moment? And so I talk about that a little bit more from your own situation because it's very common for women in particular to take a bad moment a 30 second snapshot out of the thousands of seconds in a day and turn it into, I had a bad day because. Yeah. So I think that uh, we like to dwell in things and um, we like to find things that suit our purpose or our cause. Right. So, you know, if something bad happens and then a few minutes later, it's like, Oh, that was two things. So everything comes in three. So we're always mm -hmm. like, kind of the same thing as looking for the positive. Now we're looking for the negative things. So you can sit there at the end of the day and this happened and this happened and this happened in your mood. Every time something happens to you that you feel is unjust or, you know, whatever um, contributes to the bad day, your mood goes like this and this and, yeah. and you spew that outwardly to your spouse when he gets home or to the kids when they get home, they're running around, they're excited to be home. They've, you know, been sitting in a desk all day. So they have some, you know, energy that they need to burn off and you're snapping at them. Just be quiet. I've, you know, whatever. And your husband comes home and he throws his boots or his clothes on the floor. And that just adds to your bad day. Yeah. So, you know, like there's so many things throughout our day that can, that can throw us off and affect our mood. But, you know, you got to maybe engage with the kids like, Hey, let's make a game and let's be quiet for five minutes, you know, so we, or let's have a breathing exercise. If you just can't take any more, change the mindset instead of yelling and creating stressful environment and upsetness in the whole house, make a game out of it or try and, you know, remove yourself from a situation or, you know, like things like that, that can distract you from falling down this, you know, spiral of anger or upsetness, you know, even in, um, to go back a little bit to talk about, um, like getting a diagnosis or something like mm -hmm. that. And trying to, like, I think women and men, human beings as general, define that whole diagnosis or sickness or ailment as their whole self. And it's yeah. like, I am now cancer almost, or I am now yeah. diabetes. And, you know, my whole world is sh shooken up and whatever. Instead of trying to find positive things that have happened, okay, now I'm cleaning up my health and I'm, 
you know, getting back on track and pe- I'm making more of a point to um, engage with my family. I'm changing bad habits and making them into good ones because it's for my health and not accepting the diagnosis as mm-hmm. the person, as me, but as, you know, an opportunity to make a difference mm-hmm. in your life. Right. So. Well, I love that. I, I, I really discuss that um, a lot in the book that we are not the diagnosis and the diagnosis actually doesn't belong to us, right? It's something that's been put on you, which also means it's something that can be taken off or even not worn as it were. So many people, they actually stroke their their diagnosis, the sickness. How many times have you seen people Oh, my arthritis. Oh, forget that, right? Move on with your life. People become their diagnosis because they go on Dr. Google and they research it and they literally become it. They follow it to a T. Well, this is going to happen and now this is going to happen. Now that that's happened, this is going to happen. And it's simply not true. Once you have you know, any type of a long-term or a chronic diagnosis, you can become well, right? You can limit the symptoms. You can try, you know, bring that um, illness and reverse course, right? The challenge is, is, you know, we don't, <clears throat> we don't see healing because we don't seek healing, Right. Too many people say, well, you know, I drank water one day and that didn't work, right? The reality, again, is that, you know, health is not a part-time habit. It is a lifestyle. And it's all about the choices that we make, whether we choose to be angry, right? Whether we choose to, you know, let, you know, the dog puking all over the floor destroy the rest of our day right? Whether we choose to lay in bed instead of just getting up and get getting showered and going forward, it's all about choices. When I was in um, the horrible state that I was and hardly able to move every single day, I put on my boots and I went out to the barn and I fed my animals and I mucked out the barn, even when the pain was so bad. But it provided such an amazing uh, mental, emotional shift for me that going and doing that was therapy, right? Honestly, if I wouldn't have done that, right, it would have been less movement in my day. I mean, there were days where I was getting less than a thousand steps a day. Minimal movement because there was pain, right? And we know that when you don't move it, you lose it. You lose the capacity to move it when you stop, right? We see this so clearly in the elderly um, sitting in nursing homes where maybe, you know, they're not there cooking and washing dishes and moving their hands. Their hands start to seize up and then pretty soon they're just always like this. But that happens everywhere in our body. And the more stationary you are, actually, the more exponentially the pain is. Mm -hmm. And I would challenge our listeners, right, that the same goes true for your mind. If you are listening to the same self-defeating, negative, depressive, angry song about how horrible your life is, you're not exercising all of the brain cells and the neurons and the memories that are about hope and peace and joy. You're not looking for that new exciting song about the sun will shine tomorrow. You're You're also making yourself sicker because your mind will, you know, contribute to your overall well-being. So... Well, yeah, and let's talk about that. I talk a lot about, you know, mindset in the book. I think some people, you know, were hoping for more very specific, you know, prescriptions um, for, you know, sickness. And I do give some specifics, but a lot of it really is the mindset because if you can't uh, choose life, 
if you can't choose to live today, right? We, um, you know, everyone dies. That you know, everyone that's born dies, but very few people, very few women, choose to live. There are so many lives unlived here, right? That we're always waiting for a better day, waiting for tomorrow, waiting till I feel better, waiting till there's less pain, waiting until, right, the relationship resolves. Stop waiting. Like, really, you have to live your life now. You have to live your life today. We're not promised tomorrow. Today's the day to live. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you lay down at the end of the night that you can assess your day and say, yeah, that was a day well lived. Yeah. Yeah. And try and do something for yourself. Turn off the, the, how many times have people said this, turn off the devices, turn off the TV and go inward and think of positive things that, you know, um, think about your day counter blessings. I mean, so simplistic goes back how many years, thousand years, maybe count your blessings. And it really does change your mindset because if you fall asleep with all that crap in your brain, well, how well do you think you're going to sleep? You sleep is our time for rejuvenation. The body detoxifies itself and stuff. If you're tossing and turning and thinking about this, that needs to be done, or this person ticked you off or ingested you in some way, you know, like that's all toxins that are going back into the body over and over and over and over again and making yourself sick. So, you know, like, um, I've started now and I am not a bath person. I am not a bath person. I will have one occasionally. My husband is a bath person, but I saw this, um, really interesting study done on a detoxifying bath and it's a little bit of uh, baking soda, a little bit of lemon juice and, um, apple cider vinegar, pure organic with the mother. So if you don't know what the mother is, it's the little membrane that floats around. You can make your own too. But I've been putting that in the bath and I've been just laying in there for about an hour and uh, putting a face cloth over my head. No devices, no TV to distract me, letting me uh, sweat out all the toxins and just really center myself and focus on um, health and well-being and positive uh, mental attitude, you know. And, you know, I've had some pretty great sleeps. I've only done it twice. So um, I'll let you know how it goes or whatever, but um, can't hurt me. And uh, I, I'm really excited to see what that does, not only for my physical self, self as far as detoxifying the body, uh, not giving any medical <laughs> advice. So maybe talk to your doctor or healthcare professional if you want to do that for yourself. But um, yeah, but more importantly, my own mindset and going to bed with a really fresh, relaxed, calm mind. Yeah, it sounds really intriguing. I'd like to do some research into that. Obviously, you know, baking, they're all uh, great detoxifiers and alkalizers individually. And so to put that in the bath so that it can be absorbed uh, through our pores and actually even just pull out toxins through the pores, uh, using that heat to actually expand the pores is uh, a really great idea. So many people use the Epsom salts, right? It pulls out the toxins, the magnesium gives them that sense of relaxation. So I'd be interested to do um, some research on that specific. And I would say, you know, a lot of women, especially moms and working moms, they're not bath people because they don't make the time for it. They're literally working two or three jobs and coming home at the end of the day and just totally like crashing, you know, they're up until midnight, one, two in the morning, trying to get everything done. And then it's on repeat again at six or 7 a.m. And, you know, even if it's once a week, ladies, you know, it's, it's important to, to set that time aside for yourself because um, you make time for everybody else and everything else. And if you, you know, you let your cup cup run dry or you know you're full of toxins and whatever else you aren't available to do all those things right so your body will shut down and make you slow down and you know yes. come inward so the point is is to take care of yourself um, I think you've said it many times and I'm pretty positive it's in your book right but um, you have to start 
um, healing yourself and having the positive mental attitude and eating well and stuff before there's a problem, right? It's harder to fix once there's a problem there. Well, and it's true. Like, you know, we have a sliding scale of health. The problem is, is because symptoms develop very slowly over time, our picture, our vision of health moves with us, right? And so I, you know, tell the story about constipation. Well, you know, if you're constipated one day, maybe two days, you don't really pay much attention to it. It's a little bit annoying, right? And so some people in my clinical practice have a bowel movement every seven, nine, 10, 12, 14 days. That's extreme. But what, because it becomes a historical thing, they still believe they're healthy because that's their normal, right? Please don't evaluate your normal based on a set of symptoms that never goes away. It's not normal to not have a bowel movement every day. It's not normal to have pain in your knees or your hands every moment of the day. It's not normal to have migraines or heartburn or blood sugar challenges. We've been led to believe that in our current society because it's what everyone is going through. Yeah, well, that's part of the re part of the problem is, or probably the majority part of the problem is, is that those that... Um, like you walk into a grocery store or a um, drug store or whatever, what's all in front of you is all the crap and the garbage and stuff. And then at the very back is the pharmacy. So they give you all this crap to, you know, fill your body with toxins. And then they sell the cure at the back of the store, except for it's not a cure. It's yeah. just a masking of your symptoms. Your body's telling you something, Hey, there's something not right here. But, you know, like you pause when something first happens, like, oh, what was that? Or that didn't feel right. And, mm -hmm. oh, geez, you know, and then, you know, a couple of days go by and you, you can find that you can live with it or function with it. And then, oh, I didn't die. So I guess everything's OK. Go to the doctor. The doctor maybe sloughs you off or says that's ah, just heartburn or it's just this or it's just that. Here's some pills. And then so you just continue on and then okay the body's like oh shoot that's that's really bad but i'll keep that over here but now because you have this inflammatory stuff happening here now it's going to start over here and over here and then all of a sudden your yeah. whole body is inflamed and you're going well what happened i just had heartburn right but <laughs> well and you know people think that you know sickness is a suddenly moment oh all of a sudden right? I have this major situation that never goes away. It's not an all of a sudden moment. You know, our body is in, you know, a state of disconnect or unbalance for many days, many weeks, many months before you have that kind of like, oh my gosh, what's really wrong with me? And I, what I would like to put out there and what I've seen clinically for over 16 years and in my own life, right, is the, the more stressed we are, the faster that falling apart will happen. You know, ladies, stress is a killer. There is a reason why occasionally you see commercials or things like that on TV about, you know, stress killing. Because when we are constantly under fight or flight, panic mode, oh my gosh, you know, crazy woman, you know, you've got 20 hands coming out of you and you're doing 300 things at the same time, that keeps you locked into that fight or flight mode. When we're in that panic response, our digestion does not work. So sometimes people ask me, well, but I'm eating all of this healthy food and, you know, why, why am I so unwell or why am I not getting the right vitamins or minerals or nutrients? Because your digestion isn't working. You're not breaking down the food. You're not able to absorb the nutrients. Your bowels are either too loose or they're too tight. And so it prevents your body's ability to function properly. You can eat all the best food in the world, but if you're eating on the run and, you know, going, you know, 20 hours in between eating and not drinking enough water and not getting enough sleep, it's really all for naught. It's the whole package of what you're doing. It's more than the food. 
It's the thought process. It's the food. It's the water. It's the sleep. And it's also what we're doing for body movement. And then that restorative rest that you were talking about, Robin, just can you get quiet with yourself? Can you breathe? Can you do something that truly feeds your soul, makes your heart sing at least once a week? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would encourage a little more than once a week, but (laughs) (laughs) it is a good start for those who find themselves exceptionally busy. But yeah, you got to quiet your mind and and learn to be alone with yourself. A lot of people can't be alone with themselves or their own thoughts, and they are very afraid of that. And I guess the what I would like to put out is, what are you afraid of? What do you think is going to happen? You know, like if you're over talking somebody, like your husband's talking, you always feel like you need to over talk them, or um, you're alone for five minutes and you got to text somebody or phone somebody or you go somewhere for coffee and you just can't sit in your own space and, and be well and think about things that you like or you want to do. Not like the task list or things, but mm-hmm. things of accomplishment like um, growing a, what a, seeds am I going to grow in my garden this year or whatever, you know, because it's getting to be that time. Anything that tickles your fancy that is going to build you up and make yeah. you show up better in your life. But people can't do that. They find it so challenging. Like they're on TikTok or Facebook or Instagram, always searching and and, in, and watching through a screen other people's lives and seeing them do things and oh, wow, gee, I wish I could be them or I wish I could be on the trip. And they look like they have such a fantastic life. Well, they're presenting only a snapshot and they're showing you a small piece of it and you're buying into it. You know, sometimes those people that are, um, what do they call those people on uh, Instagram? Influencer. Uh, influencers, you know, they're influencing you to buy things or buy into their products yeah. or buy into the fact that, their life is so much better than yours and it and it keeps pushing you down. Like you're looking at it and you're not going, oh, wow, that encourages me to do those things. You're looking at it and going, why can't I do that? And, and why, you know, is my life like this? And theirs is like that. Exactly. Why? It's because you're not participating in your life. You're too busy yeah. watching everybody else's and making sure that everyone else is taken care of and not your own. Well, and that's a really good point. And I think, you know, first of all, a lot of that is comparison. And, you know, we uh, comparison is the thief of joy. We cannot compare our lives to those around us. We can compare our lives to our life yesterday or last week or last year. What are you doing to up level your life? What are mm-hmm. you doing to create your own beautiful life? Dreams are possibilities, but your dreams are not possible unless there's action behind them. The reason that most people don't live their dreams is just for what you said. You're too busy watching other people's dreams rather than activating your own. You're too busy living other people's lives than living your own. You're too busy trying to do what everyone else is doing rather than living your own. And, you know, I discuss this extensively about we are each our own color in, you know, the rainbow of life, right? If, if both you and I, Robin, were shades of pink, right, I guarantee you we're going to be a different shade. It's going to be a different hue, a different saturation, a different brightness, right? Because we are uniquely us. There are no photocopies of people. Even if you take identical twins, they are not identical. There are still nuances that are different, that are interplayed with um, what we are experiencing in life, how we're interpreting life, and even the stressors and how they impact us. You can take two identical twins, you can separate them at birth and put them in different situations and circumstances. And when you bring them back together, say at 20 or 30 years of age, in many, many, many cases, they don't even look the same. So please tell me how they're a photocopy of each other when under pressure, under stress, different life um, circumstances, that their whole even physical appearance changes Mm -hmm. right we have to show up as our our best self 
right? Every day. I'm not trying to be like anyone else. I want to be the person that I was created to be. And in many cases, ladies, we've just forgotten. We've put our dreams on the, on the shelf because somewhere along the line, it became too hard, too difficult, or someone told us we can't, mm -hmm. right? And I've lived my whole life um, really with the tenacity to, oh yeah? And some of my friends who know me really well will say, don't say no to Roxanne because she will prove you wrong. Like I will find a way, right? So if we're gonna find a way for our kids, or we're gonna find a way for our husband, right? Or our mother, right? Why will we not find a way for ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the difference between a dream and a goal is a time frame. So um, a dream will forever be a dream, but a goal, you know, you set yourself five, 10, you know, and I always say, and I tell my kids all the time, set small challenges for yourself. Do something that's you can you know for a hundred percent that you can accomplish in a week or a month or whatever. Set that goal, get that you know euphoria feeling of oh wow I did that and it becomes addictive. So you can always go forward and not just sit there and go oh geez I wish you know I wish I wish I wish I wish. No, this is what I want and this is how. Um, I'm going to get there and this is my time frame, right? Are you going to have bumps and curves and, you know, S whatever and fall off a cliff sometimes? Absolutely. But those are the best learning, you know, and that's how you get to being where you, you know, want to be. You can't just, if you could just walk across the street and there's your, your goal, well, everyone would be doing it. Would it really be a goal? Anything worth um, doing in life is always challenging, right? So it's a challenge for yourself, get your mind going, you're firing things in your mind, like all the things, your neurons, blah, blah, blah. And the motivation, reason to get up in the morning, excitement, your excitement bubbles over to somebody else. And then they're, they're like, Oh, wow, look what they're doing. So maybe I could, you know, set my goals, they did it. You know, this person maybe only has grade 12, or, you know, they have um, handicaps that prevent them from doing things, but they're still doing it. So what's wrong with me? I should be doing those things too. It's encouragement. And I think that it, um, when you're excited about life, everyone around you is excited. So. Oh. Yeah. A delay. I agree. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I agree. I think uh, that's really amazing. And um, uh, there's uh, two thoughts that I have today. So I, I want to end just with reading uh, just a small section um, from my book, just because I think it helps with what we've been talking about. And um, page 272, the first audacious choice I made was to choose life over diagnosis. Because of that one choice, an avalanche of bold choices and positive uh, results happened. I consistently choose peace over fear, health over medication, pleasure over pain. I choose to tap into and stand firm in the power of the woman that God created me to be. I make the choice to be a generous giver, a passionate lover, and a radiant soul. I choose to see how life is happening for me, not to me. And I make better choices about how I show up in the world around me. I also choose language that lifts me up rather than beats me up. I choose meanings for my challenges that help me see the silver lining so I can thrive in any circumstance, undaunted and fearless. Part of choosing more empowering language is asking better questions, such as how can I be and live even more passionately in this moment? Or how can I increase my energy right now? I used to ask questions such as what did I do wrong or why me? Why is this happening? That type of question never gets us anywhere. It causes us to presume that there is something wrong with us and the focus becomes what is wrong, not what is right. There can never be a good solution when I direct the question in a blameful way at myself. Telling myself what is wrong with me won't fix the current situation. It doesn't help us look for a way to correct the problem or move forward. Questions that start with how help us find our situation. How can I add value to the situation? How can I show up as my best self right now? How can I choose to love myself in this moment? 
How can I move my body to feel more alive right now? How based questions direct us towards empowering action steps to find resolve and do our best given the situation rather than hurting ourselves even more. Asking how centered questions demand that we look at the blessings in the situation or the blessing that we can be to the problem. Changing the question changes the story and prevents us from focusing on pain and suffering rather than pleasure and love. Life is a blessing for those who choose to see it that way, or it can be a curse with no hope in sight for those who are running away from it. It is all about the choices you make. My purpose for sharing my story is to not tell you how to live, but to convince you that you can, to inspire you to believe that there is more for your life than the life you are currently experiencing. So Audaciously Alive, uh, pick it up on Amazon or any major uh, bookstore. I wanted to read something as well. I got a really amazing um, text yesterday um, from a young man who um, has messaged me and said, I, I've received your book. I'm excited to read it. And uh, this is what he shared. Um, I don't have my own review for you yet. My girlfriend came over when I started reading it and she hijacked it, LOL. She really connected with the message, so I loaned it to her. She is shocked with how well you've described the battles women go through, and she is amazed at how the words you wrote have helped her to understand her own feelings. She gives it a 10 out of 10. Goes on to share, I'm not much of a believer, um, but this has to have been fate. She has been going through some issues lately, and when I read the introduction to her, she became very emotional. Every word you wrote has, was something she had been feeling, but could not understand it on her own. You are the one who gave her that gift, and I thank you on her behalf. I just wanted you to know that your message about personal health, acceptance, and wellness has helped someone in a very impactful way. I hope it gives you joy that the person it has helped is very important to me. And I can tell you how much you've helped her. And subsequently, you've also helped me. So that was a really sweet, um, you know, uh, comment. And, you know, although the book is written uh, for women, I actually wrote it um, for men as well, right? In relationships with women that are struggling and relationships with women, generally speaking, because, you know, men speak through blue megaphones and hear through blue hearing aids and women speak through pink megaphones and hear through pink hearing aids. And so sometimes in our communication, there is a disconnect and we don't hear things the way that they should be, and we don't experience things um, the same way as our spouse or our partner. And this is where the relationship can start to get rocky when women can't, you know, put pause on their mental, emotional, uh, you know, situation or their physical situation. They can't jump outside their body. And men in particular find it really difficult when the woman goes internal and kind of shuts off that communication. The book is written for that in mind and to help spouses, you know, uh, understand what's going on, but also to give them the tools to help their beloved to rise up out of the ashes and, you know, help to um, see themselves uh, in the light that they were created, full of radiance, full of beauty, full of hope, peace, joy, love, and to really choose to live audaciously alive each and every day. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful message for sure. <laughs> People have to uh, realize that they're put on earth for a reason. And that's why a lot of people struggle is because they don't find out what their purpose on earth is and that we aren't meant to have hard, hurtful lives. So, yeah. Finding your inner peace, joy, love, contentment. It's a journey, but... You can get there. Amen. 
But we're going to close in, in prayer. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak life and blessing over every woman. Lord, that you would help them to see the amazingly radiant and beautiful woman that you've created them to be. That you would flood them with hope and peace and joy. That they would choose to live well each and every day and make those difficult choices to feed their body, feed their soul. And, uh, Lord, we ask that you would just help them to press pause on their day and find that moment in their day to really experience pleasure, seek out pleasure, and uh, look at their situation uh, from a clean, fresh slate on uh, how life is happening to them, not for them. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Ladies, thank you for joining us. Have an amazing day. We are blessed uh, that um, you would be here. Uh, you can follow uh, me on RoxanneHarris.ca and also... Be on the lookout for the Audacious Kitchen. We'll do our first episode this week. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll live stream it in the same way. Uh, Robin, thanks so much for joining me. And I hope that everyone has an absolutely spectacular day. Can you hear me?